Hello again, this is Mark Mitchell. Hope you're doing well. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 10 for a few minutes and another interesting chapter to look at, but it's on race and ethnicity. And of course, uh, just an overview of where we're going to be headed today. Uh, you can see here lots of uh, topics that are in the uh, e-text or textbook, whichever one you have. But uh, we start with inventing ethnicity and race, and we'll get to some more detail of that momentarily. And then some origins of racial and ethnic diversity in the United States. And then uh, by the end of the chapter, uh, how the world has really changed in terms of multiracial and multi-ethnic multi identities. Our articles in the chapter that our author includes just as uh, additional uh, helpful things to illustrate some of the points in the chapter uh, are here on this uh, next slide. But we in, end up with something uh, under called understanding whiteness, and uh, some would maybe add to that as white privilege. And then uh, the last article there is about Black Lives Matter, which I'm sure is something that uh, just about everybody's heard about over the last, say, three to four years. Okay, but we start out first with uh, definitions of ethnicity and race. And uh, ethnicity really refers, as you can see from the definition, a cultural heritage. So we've already had a chapter on culture, but that's a way of life. It's social. That's really kind of the point of the cultural heritage is it's something that people create. And race, for example, you may think of that of being more biological and uh, that is true when it comes to um, eye color, hair color, skin color. But also when you make up racial classification systems, they're in some regards just like ethnicity, but it's something that's more of a social categorization. And it ought to remind us of the stratification that we have been talking about uh, also from prior chapters. But uh, really interesting to me how important, and our book makes this point too, but uh, how people focus on skin color, but, you know, why not eye color, why not hair color, or some other trait like that. Now, it's not mentioned in our book, but uh, just to show you, there was a, a famous experiment by Miss Jane Elliott. And she, with her uh, early young class of children back in the 60s, late 60s, she was trying to impress upon them some of the things we'll see today in our our textbook on this chapter about race and ethnicity, but she did it through eye color, eye color, and it was called The Class Divided, which is everywhere online. But, you know, we could create a system where we could experience some discrimination and other things just simply based on some of these traits uh, other than skin color. All right, but uh, the last two things mentioned here on our slide really illustrate some of the things I've mentioned, but they are social construction, meaning it's simply... A method to rank people it's stratification and the reason that people are ranked unfortunately is because of uh, monitor monetary resources and things of value we've got to have some way really to divide them up and this is just the way that it's been in the world for the longest amount of time I know that's not a satisfying answer but that's really uh, how it has been our book just shows us for example where you find lighter skin tones and where you find darker skin tones and our graph uh, is very helpful but it says this really lines up pretty much with places that have more sunshine more sunlight and exposure to it and places that don't so obviously when you uh, your skin is exposed to sunlight to a greater degree then your skin is going to take a darker tone and even to bring forth some of the ideas that we've already seen on this slide, it just mentions that you can have people with similar skin tones or colors, but yet depending on where they live, they might be thrown into a different racial uh, category. So that's, again, very interesting, but it just further underlies the idea that this is really something that people have come up with. It's not really uh, biological per se, as maybe something like, your biological sex or other traits where you certainly can trace it to biology, but that's not uh, the case when it comes to ethnicity and race. All right, but uh, just lots of definitions here on our slides, and uh, some of them I'm sure you're very familiar with, and others uh, just maybe the terminology is a little bit new, maybe the idea not so much, but just it has a label we haven't seen before. So certainly everyone is familiar with racism. You know, we can also talk about 
gender, but that's not in our chapter two, but you're probably familiar with the idea of this discrimination or this treatment of one leading uh, or one category of people being superior to the other, whether it's by race, again, in this chapter, or maybe by sex, um, but we're familiar with that. Okay, but uh, the next term, maybe not so much, but racial essentialism is the idea that, hey, the reason that we do maybe have the differences in people by racial categories is because some are superior to others. And so that would begin to start to take on a biological explanation. And it's just that there's a lot of lacking proof for that. So uh, some of the things in our book are, are mentioned and they really are uh, poor attempts to describe differences in the race, the races that we see, if you even want to use that. The next slide just shows us, for example, the U.S. Census form and how the government, for example, tracks a lot of this information. Um, that's interesting to track. And again, we, are, we do that to make sure that discrimination is, is not happening to groups of people as it was in the past. Now, in the e-text on page 241, they give us some of these census forms from around the world and different uh, nations of the world. And they look a little bit different, but they're really doing the same thing. So that's figure 10.2, but take a look at that. There's several different examples that are really interesting to look at um, if you haven't looked at something like that before. Our book here also, as a trend, also talks about power quite a bit. And here it brings in power when it's talking about race and ethnicity. And so that's um, a very key concept to remember throughout our book and throughout this chapter as well. Our book mentions minority and majority groups. And usually in the past, people would define a minority group as one that had fewer members, a countable number uh, that's lower or less than what you find in the majority. And that's certainly one way to distinguish between these two, but it's not the way that our book does it. Our book really brings in that concept of power. So a minority group would be those without power, and a majority group would be those with power. And that gets into something fairly recent that um, may be somewhat controversial. So imagine, for example, if we looked at gender and sex again, there are more women who are alive today than there are men. So they are women are a numerical majority, but yet their power is less than what you find for men. It's getting closer all the time. We're getting more even. But uh, in that case, numerically, the, the group that's around the most, women, have less power. So they would be considered the minority group if you look at it from that way. All right, so that's uh, how we do it today. And, of course, we'll have some other charts that really show us who's uh, the majority, considered the majority in the United States along racial and ethnic lines and, and who's uh, considered the minority. Some very familiar terms here on our next slide under this uh, section of structure and power among racial and ethnic groups, but uh, prejudice is simply in a positive or negative evaluation of someone or usually something. In this case, it would be someone, but you kind of have these ideas in mind that are not based on facts and evidence. Uh, that's the idea of prejudice or prejudging as our book looks at it. Stereotypes are, for example, pictures of people that we paint that are un generally untrue. Um, maybe we've had something happen to us in the past and then we decide to paint everybody else who belongs to that category in the same way. That's what that stereotype is talking about. Now, these first two terms really talk about your thoughts. okay? And the last term is discrimination, but that really refers to your behavior. So people can be prejudiced or stereotyped and not discriminate. Um, and of course, the opposite, they can very well do also, but you can be prejudiced and stereotyped and discriminate, uh, but that's really the difference between them. One is uh, in your head, and then uh, the other is your behavior. All right, again, when we look at uh, the interaction between the majority and minority, we have lots of terms here. But pluralism is the ideal that of what the United States as a nation has operated on. You may have all these different groups, but they're treated equally. Amalgamation is when you have some of all these different groups and they kind of come together. So uh, it would be, you know, really supposed to be an equal 
a new group of compiled of all the different groups you may have. And uh, just think of all the different types of groups that we have in the United States. You know, there was quite a few listed on the census form. Uh, assimilation is where the minority group adopts to the majority group. So they would adopt uh, the culture there that's most prevalent. And then segregation and genocide is when things are not going well. We can think of times in the United States where things were segregated. Um, and then, of course, genocide is when uh, an entire group of people are being killed off by another, not because they're criminal, but just because of their existence and uh, just not getting along. Our book uh, goes on to mention some of the minority group responses to discrimination. So uh, they simply leave or withdraw. Uh, passing means they're there and fitting in. Uh, code switching is a term that was developed by Elijah Anderson uh, not too long ago, but it complies, um, refers to the idea of complying with the social expectations of the majority uh, when you're there with them, but in private, uh, you really revert back to your own culture. And then finally, resistance is when the majority there, uh, they kind of pitch in and try to help the minorities uh, and stop some of this discrimination that's going on. So that's how Again, four ways that minority groups respond to that discrimination. We've got lots of information in the book that goes through the origins of racial and ethnic diversity in the United States. So, so we're going to highlight a few things there and then uh, actually just move on. So uh, the native or indigenous people were the people who were first here. And so that's uh, typically Native Americans that we refer to. We've got an interesting graph on page 243 that really shows the United States broken down into these native peoples and where they lived. And then uh, you can tell by the graph in our book that it wasn't long before they were basically pushed, uh, Native Americans that is, were pushed onto reservations uh, by the uh, settlers there from Europe. So throughout history, uh, that's what has happened. One group of people has usually mistreated another and then uh, destroyed their civil civilization and built upon it, um, but we find that, you know, not only in the United States, but around the world. Uh, unfortunately for the civilizations that had to bear the brunt of that, you know, that's not nice no matter uh, where it happens at all. All right, um, we move on there to uh, a couple other groups. Now, on the other slide uh, with the native peoples that were mentioned, it also mentions, mentions the Hispanics or sometimes uh, referred to as Latinos, and then uh, Mexican-Americans and Puerto Ricans are also listed there on page 243 and 244. Uh, we move to our next slide, the WASP, the White Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Uh, that would be the group that really, for example, would have a lot of the power and the authority that would be considered the majority group, and a lot of the uh, leaders of the country, for example, uh, would have maybe that type of connection. They're contrasted with the white ethnic groups, which really don't have a lot of that. So that would include groups uh, such as Celtic or Alpine or Mediterranean. Uh, also, the Irish are mentioned there. And then there's a, a couple periods of time in which, um, or you know, a rather lengthy period of time in which uh, immigration to the United States over a uh, little more than 30 years is mentioned there in our textbook and how uh, that has influenced the nation. We've got some graphs later on that really show of immigration to the United States and where that has occurred from. And so there's periods where we have a lot of immigration from outside the United States. And I think this was actually represented to one of those periods. And then we have lulls. And then, of course, it uh, goes high again. But we'll come to that graph uh, a little bit later. All right. We, um, again, the... Another group we want to talk about, um, Native, or excuse me, African Americans. We already mentioned Native Americans, but think of all the groups that are listed in our book. Probably Native Americans are the ones that have been persecuted the most, and just not a lot of happy things really to report for that group over a long period of time. African Americans, you could also uh, say the same thing, but uh, they have made gains as a as a group of people. For example. Uh, Barack Obama being the first African-American president uh, elected uh, over 10 years ago. So uh, that's a, a good thing. Not that uh, everything is like what you 
you want it to be. Our chapter kind of ends that way and says a lot of progress has been made, but there's still more that, that needs to happen to make uh, the world, or, or especially the United States, the place it needs to be. All right, but they mention, uh, of course, here on this slide, a lot of that is simply uh, slavery that affected African Americans. And then after uh, the freedom was granted by legislation acts uh, by uh, the Abraham Lincoln around the 1860s, it, there's still some problems. And our book has some um, some rather gruesome pictures there that show uh, some of the treatment that people uh, endured during this time. All right, I uh, got a slave here, a graph here that helps uh, to show maybe some of the uh, the reasons that slavery was in America, but it really refers you to uh, her trade routes that uh, went around quite a bit of the world, and you can see how our book describes that. And of course, the passage that uh, the, a lot of these ships took to the United States was called the Middle Passage there, but uh, it makes you realize. You know, a, a statement that you hear quite a bit, but money makes the world go around, and that includes even if people are mistreated. It's just simply a, a sad fact of life is that uh, economics makes people do some things that just don't doesn't make sense sometimes. All right, as we move on, we also look at Asian Americans, and uh, uh, some of the charts in our chapter really show uh, there's, there's not a lot of um, people in the United States with an Asian background, but yet... You know, if the United States is such a discriminatory place, then maybe this is one of those things where we would have to ask a couple questions. The first would be, then why is it that uh, Asians as a, as a whole are called the model minority, and they tend to make more than any other group, including whites, in the United States? So that's, again, one of those uh, positive things to say to show that a minority group can succeed in the United States. Second thing might be that if the United States is um, such a terrible place, then why do people continually want to come here rather than uh, a number of other places? I know it's been in the news here for several months, but there was a caravan of people who were making their way to the United States, and they were uh, walking through Mexico and some other places. But they could have stopped in Mexico and stayed there. But uh, a lot of the people who were interviewed said, well, they thought there was a better life for them waiting in the United States. And so that's an interesting statement. Uh, the United States may have some problems. Uh, maybe more progress is needed in racial relations. But simply some people recognize that uh, there are some places in the world that will lead to a better life uh, chances, as our book uh, mentions, and a better life outcome uh, for them. Our book mentions a, a couple other groups here under Asian Americans, the Chinese and the Japanese, for example. And what's interesting about those groups is they have experienced quite a bit of discrimination, too. For example, Chinese Americans were um, in demand out west in the United States during the gold rush. But when those jobs dried up, the yellow peril was uh, mentioned then. So when jobs were not plentiful, the Chinese were blamed, and that was not their fault at all. The Japanese citizens, they were rounded up in the early 1940s during World War II, and they were blamed um, or are thought to be enemies of the United States when a lot of these people were citizens just as anyone else. They were second and third generation uh, people in the United States, and they had to spend two years out west for no reason other than the fears that they might turn on the United States. So... <clears throat> and what was interesting is that that didn't happen to any other group of people other than Japanese. So we were also at war with Germany, but yet um, they were not rounded up as well. So we often see a lot of unequal and unfair treatment happening with different groups. All right. Our book Next goes to a slide there, and it mentions diversity today. So we see lots of different groups that are mentioned here. And again, just to emphasize how racial categories of people can be created, I'm not sure if you're aware, you, you may be, but before President Obama left office, his administration wanted to create a new racial classification for people. And so um, I just wanted to show you, for example, if you're interested in that, um, where you could 
you could find it if you wanted to. Uh, but I had looked up that, and here's just that article. You know, it's uh, a little old. It's from September 30th of 2016. But that new classification of people would be called Middle East and North African designation, or MENA. But it was simply, uh, you know, a new one. We often think of race as biological, that you couldn't create a category, but yet uh, that that's an interesting point to look at. I think the numbers and percentages listed here in our chart are a little high. But, for example, they're saying the percentage of the population that's white uh, is a little about 73%. And again, we got le on the left-hand side race, and then on the right-hand side, we've got ethnicity. Uh, this chart, a little hard to, to look at, but again, in quintiles, but really just shows where the foreign population comes from in the United States. And it seems, uh, you know, Asia, for example, is really a place where we find a lot of uh, those immigrants that are coming to the U.S., and then Latin America and the Caribbean. I think the group that I mentioned that was walking to the United States was actually from, coming from Latin America. All right, here's where you have ebbs and flows, but you can see um, some of the older dates on, from the chart on the left. You can see that you know a third to almost 40% of the population coming to the United States uh, was outside the United States, and then we had a, a real lull. Looks like it crashed uh, up until about 1970. And now it seems uh, to be going up quite again. And around the world as well, we see a lot of people are, are moving around and finding new places to live. Uh, so that's kind of interesting, and we'll see the effects of that, I'm sure, in the, in the coming years and decades ahead. We also look at transnational uh, migrants, but transnational, of course, across and nations, uh, people who, for example, are finding new homes in the world, but still, you know, remember the ethnicity, the culture, where they come from. We've seen that term remittances before, but when people uh, come to another country, they send that money that they have earned back home to help uh, families. Big topic in the United States for some time has been immigration and whether people are here legally or illegally, and it's been a failure of Congress. Uh, they've known about this for years, and should have come up with a, a decision about that, but uh, that's one we're still struggling with. And, of course, there's lots of uh, ways to look at it. Again, I think economics is one of the big things uh, that happens. And then, um, you know, especially for young people that uh, were born here without much of a say, you know, about 75% of people want them to be able to stay. They just think that is uh, too harsh to make people, young people, leave that uh, didn't have a choice and, we're in the United States. Our next slide, again, looks at uh, racial and ethnic inequality. Again, that's a, a topic from power. Our book always looks at cl culture, structure, and power. Uh, at the end of the chapters, there's always something mentioned there on those uh, three topics. We've looked at already about discrimination and prejudice, but uh, we could look at in-groups and out-groups. We could also look um, how stereotypes and prejudice influence uh, beliefs and attitudes of, of different groups of people. And then we already mentioned about how discrimination is, is action, something that is uh, behavior that's conducted. What if the discrimination is conducted by institutions? So, for example, the government uh, you know, is a good illustration of that with the Black Lives Matter article that's near the end of the chapter. Uh, you know, are African Americans being treated differently and unfairly by the legal system? Uh, we could also maybe look at um, the institution of medicine. You know, do people of different races get treated the same when it comes to their health care? Uh, are home loans made at the same rate to people based on their race? Our book mentions redlining, and that's the idea that minorities really don't get a fair shake when it comes to housing. And so they may be uh, told that the, the housing is not available or it's going to be more expensive or some other thing that would not be told to, to others. Okay, um, our book just moves on again and looks at some theories that are talking about uh, this type of treatment. And uh, they mention split labor market theory. 
a theory that uh, ethnic and racial conflicts emerge uh, when you have different groups that are competing for the same job. Uh, another interesting theory has its kind of its roots in religion, but the scapegoat theory is when you typically blame a weaker group or some type of um, problem that's really not uh, in their fault at all. But because the power structure, you can take it out and blame them on them without any type of consequences for yourself. That's really where that term comes from. In the ancient past for religions, uh, the scapegoat was the animal who bore the sins of the people. And they would uh, make the, the goat go out into the wilderness and die of exposure or either uh, cut its neck and bleed it out. But that was kind of the same thing. Is Now the, the goat, the animal, must pay the price for the sins of the people. And so it's really kind of the same concept when it comes to uh, race and ethnic inequality. Our book does mention quite a bit of how uh, a lot of old racism uh, either through legal actions or uh, when people have just joined together to uh, crush a lot of that. Uh, simply, there's just been a lot of progress made over uh, the last few decades. Um, it seems like a long time ago, and, and especially to those who had to suffer under that, I'm sure it seemed even longer. Uh, but great strides have been made, and not that all that work is, is completed. Some of the areas we've already mentioned, but our slide does a good job of summarizing in which people are not treated fairly. It could be um, some other chapters we saw, for example, how obesity affected uh, whether you were paid the same or not. And people who have a normal body weight typically got paid more than people who were obese. But you can see, I already mentioned housing with redlining, but education, for example, uh, health is another justice, I will mention that briefly, and then of course uh, maybe hate crimes. Our book does go through quite a bit in showing the wealth gap when it comes, uh, for, to, uh, for example, to uh, whites and blacks. And again, the idea that uh, there's work to do, that there's still some discrimination is a point that's brought out by our book. One of the policies that does try to ad address uh, this uh, injustice is affirmative action and so there's a uh, maybe it's not a perfect way to solve the problem there would people be people who would have you know positive things to say about affirmative action and there would be some who would say well it's nothing more than uh, reverse uh, discrimination but you know how would you fix the problems of the past and if somebody could come up with a way in which uh, you know it wouldn't affect another group negatively, I'm sure that would be taken into account. Maybe a new term our book mentions is racialization of the state. And for example, uh, again, it's just showing discrimination on a higher level. For example, uh, you know, there, if one uh, typically was white, then they would have advantages that uh, maybe some would not. In other books, this would really be called white privilege. You may have heard that term from the media too, uh, but that's uh, really not something our book uses, but uh, they describe without using that term. A lot of people are unaware of the advantages that they have, maybe of being white, uh, but if you're not white, then you will probably have an easier time, maybe in some cases, coming up with some of those privileges. Our book would suggest that maybe, you know, white workers don't make any more than uh, non-white workers, but yet a lot of things in their culture they can readily identify with and they're not suspected of crimes as much or, or theft or stealing. Those would be some of the, the privileges that uh, our book actually does talk about. The next slide uh, maybe kind of addresses some of that too, but uh, here are still some problems with racism that we have today, whether it's hidden whether it's implicit or colorblind. Colorblind would be those who really say that they can't be prejudiced, uh, maybe because they have non-white friends or some kind of rationale like that. I mentioned Jane Elliott, but she does a good job in a video called The Angry Eye of addressing some of these topics, um, as well as maybe uh, something we've seen before in the culture chapter called ethnocentrism, but she has some interesting ideas there. Uh, when it comes to implicit bias, it's the again the idea that uh, someone may hold uh, these types of attitudes that do discriminate, and they're just really kind of not aware of it 
uh, but uh, they think they're they're doing a pretty good job uh, of not being biased. All right, so um, let's move on to the next slide. But um, again, our world today is changing in in some aspects because uh, in the past people had to select one of these categories that they belong to, and that was it. And now people can select more than one. I think the first person who really did that was Tiger Woods, so he deserves, I guess, some credit for that. He identifies as four categories, so white, black, Chinese, and I forget the fourth category, but uh, when he was filling out his form, he just kind of refused to only select one. As we end, come near to the end of the chapter, uh, our book just shows us, um, and maybe here's one of the ways you can look at implicit uh, discrimination or bias is would you be willing to marry somebody who's a different race or ethnicity from you uh, if not you know does that suggest anything would you marry someone who is of a different religion even though that's not the focus of our chapter but uh, that may give you a better idea of this kind of implicit or sometimes maybe hidden um, feelings that people have that could relate to uh, prejudice or stereotypes or discrimination the last few slides, as usual, just give us some things to think about. So uh, we'll just briefly kind of go through these, um, and you can decide if these are something you want to look at a little bit more or not. Uh, one of the last slides we have does talk about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and, of course, right on the heels of that, uh, now it is related to gender, uh, but uh, that's another chapter for us to look at. Uh, but the Me Too movement, the time's up. There's just lots of movements now. Uh, the March for Our Lives was about gun control. But there's just so many movements today where people are trying to address these problems that we may see that some involve gender and some involve race and ethnicity. I hope this has been helpful to you. Of course, if I can do something more to help you, uh, please let me know. But have a good day, and I'll see you the next time. Thank you.